Welcome to the Living the Dream Podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball Podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, I am joined by Nick Kemp. Nick is an author, a Japanologist, and a researcher. He is the head coach and the founder of the Ikigai Tribe, and they are a small community that serve others with the Ikigai concept. So we're going to be talking to him about that concept and what that means and where it comes from. So Nick, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much, Curtis, for having me on. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Well, why don't you start off by telling everybody about yourself? I know you're in in Australia, but just tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I'm a father. So I have a 18 year old son. I'm married to a Japanese woman and we've been together for 20 years. I love music, but of course I love Japanese culture and that's played a big part in my life. I I lived in Japan for 10 years. My first trip was actually in 1977 as a five-year-old. And I think that trip left a lasting impression and I have fond memories of that trip. I went back to Japan in 1995 as a trainee chef and worked there for a year in Tokyo and then decided to go back again in 1998. And in total, I've lived in Japan for 10 years. I'm living in Melbourne, Australia at the moment, but we'll probably go back there to live again. And yeah, it's it's formed a big part of my life in terms of learning about the culture, learning the language and and living there. And obviously now it's related to the work I do. So you say you're a Japanologist. Explain to everybody what a Japanologist is. A Japanologist is essentially someone who studies Japanese culture. So study the people, the culture, the language. And I guess that's beyond um, studying the language or studying uh, Japanese culture as a hobby. It's um, not not really a profession, but you you almost take it like a profession. And so I'm I guess I'm studying aspects of Japanese culture every day, um, specifically related to certain words and I guess Japanese psychology and Japanese well being. Speaking of certain words. Ikigai. Explain to us what that is. Ikigai. So Ikigai, that's it. Beautiful. Yeah. Ikigai is a very interesting word and concept. It's formed from two two words. So Ikiru is the verb to live in Japanese. And then Gai means value or worth. So together, Ikigai means uh, the things in your life that make life feel worth living. And of course, these things are subjective and unique to each individual. So it could be music, relationships, your roles, uh, sport, aspects of your work. And it's something you feel. So that's probably the most crucial aspect is ikigai is something you feel. So the most genuine thing about your ikigai or about the ikigai concept are your emotions. Now, what's interesting is it's become a very popular word outside of Japan, and it's been misunderstood as, you know, the sweet spot of your life where you're doing something that you're good at, that the world needs, that you can be paid for, and that you love. And while that's inspiring, that's that's actually not what ikigai is. For many Japanese, ikigai is often found in small things, so maybe their pet, their hobby, their grandchildren. So in an everyday context, it's, it's something quite small, but behind that, there's been a large body of research from the 1960s onwards on the concept. So we could relate it to eudaimonia or intrinsic motivation, or essentially that, you know, the things that make life worth living, whether they're small things or our life defining goals 
or even our most uh, challenging but life-defining experiences. So that's Ikigai in a nutshell. So tell us about the Ikigai tribe. You are the founder and the head coach. Tell us how you got that started and what you guys do. Yeah, so that was quite serendipitous, really. I About four years ago, I started seeing a Venn diagram on the internet that was, I guess, a misrepresentation of the Ikigai concept. And so I thought that that's strange. Um, you know, someone should do something about it and correct this misinterpretation. And after about a, a year of putting it off, I eventually decided to start a podcast. So like you, I have a podcast. And I started interviewing Japanese researchers and authors and everyday Japanese people on, on the concept. And then I found there were also non-Japanese researchers. And so it was really just a podcast at the beginning. And then I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I could you know, generate a business out of this? And initially, I thought I would just make a, a video course, but the more... Um, my podcast reached an audience, I started getting emails from people saying or asking if I had some sort of coaching program. So it was the first time, I guess, in my life where my audience was really telling me what they wanted. I've also been involved in online marketing and web design in my past. Yeah, so it seemed to evolve from a podcast to people saying, oh, I'd like to coach this concept. Do you offer a coaching program? And so based on that feedback, I developed a, a coaching program and sought the advice of several of the Japanese professors and researchers I'd interviewed. And they sort of gave me uh, encouragement and they were quite happy for me to pursue it. And yeah, I developed this program and it's also turned into a small community. So I have people all over the world from different countries in Europe, so in France, Germany, people from Dubai, people from the States, from Australia, and we get together every week for catch-up calls and discuss things like life meaning, life purpose, and some of these people inco incorporate what they learn into their own business, whether they're a psychologist or a a professional coach or an educator. So yeah, it sort of seemed to form very organically. How can somebody find or feel Ikigai? Well, that is the question, isn't it, <laughs> Curtis? And I guess it's very subjective, but it's the things in life that give you a lift or it's the things in life that make you feel alive. So a good example could be music. I'm sure everyone loves music. It could be walking in nature. It could be your most intimate relationship. So it's not just one thing. And it might depend also on your age. So you, Curtis, and myself are a little bit older, so we have children. So maybe when our children were quite young, they were probably our strongest source of Ikigai. And now maybe for us, I know for me and probably for you, doing this kind of work where you're interviewing people is probably also very meaningful for you. So that's another source of Ikigai. So you have your Ikigai sources, which could be people, hobbies, aspects of your work. And then you have these feelings associated to these sources. So imagine for you with your children, you have feelings of love, connection, you have intimacy, maybe there's a sense of playfulness and it will change over time. So I guess when we were younger, we were perhaps ambitious and we were thinking about the future, but as you grow and get older, even memories or past roles can be sources of Ikigai but we can always be present and grateful for the things we have in life. And again, that could go back to music, food, hobbies, anything that makes you feel that it's good to be alive. I guess that's how I'd describe it. Yeah, that's, that's how we can feel like you guy. Wait, I know you lived in Japan for 10 years. So in your experience in living in Japan, can you talk about some of the experiences that, that help you understand the Ikigai even better? 
Sure. I think one experience was living with my Japanese family. So before we returned to Australia, we decided to live with my father-in-law and his family. And he's a potter. So he makes traditional Japanese pottery. He makes these beautiful uh, tea ceremony bowls called machijawan. And what I learned about watching him work because his factory was next to his house. So it's very easy for me to pop in and take photos. And I'd often, yeah, take photos and record video of him working. He would seem to reach states of flow in his work very easily. And he would just sit cross-legged and start his pottery wheel and put a, a lump of clay on the pottery wheel. But because of his many years of uh, craftsmanship, he could sort of magically shape these bowls. And he's quite, I mean, he's very good at what he does, but he's very humble. And then about 15 years ago, despite being really successful at what he does, he decided to try and recreate a certain pottery aesthetic using traditional uh, pottery techniques. So he purchased some land. He carved out a kiln, a pottery oven in the, in the mountain slope. He had to spend thousands of dollars on firewood and got his brother, his sons involved, the whole community. They're from a small community with this endeavor to try and recreate a certain aesthetic in pottery and... The first fire failed, so all the pottery came out blistered and broken. They tried again a few weeks later, and it failed again. So the firing of the pottery took five days. And then after that, I think it was becoming too cold. Uh, I think they were moving into autumn, so they, they would have to wait six months to try it again. And even on the third attempt, it still failed and they did get some pieces which were quite good and I think a few achieved this aesthetic he was trying to create and I actually found out fairly recently we we called him because I actually wanted to write about him in my book I found out he continued to pursue this <laughs> for another 15 years and so this made me realize that for some people, their pursuit of something related to their ikigai, it's not really about, uh, you know, success or achieving the outcome. It's, it's the journey and the commitment. So this idea of Japanese craftsmanship, I think, is very much related to ikigai quite strongly. And it incorporates all these elements of, you know, flow, and commitment to craftsmanship. So I guess what I'm trying to say was I was astounded by his commitment to his craft, that he would continue for years and years and years on this passion project to try to recreate an ancient style of pottery. And it was, yeah, it was very meaningful for him, very meaningful for him, despite not succeeding. I mean, I think he succeeded, but he sort of still thinks he hasn't achieved the goal. So Japanese craftsmanship just amazes me. Well, another thing that's amazing is your book. Tell everybody about your book, <laughs> who the book is for, what inspired you to write it and, and what's the message and how can people pick it up? Oh, thank you for that. Curtis, that's very kind of you. Yeah, the, the book is this accumulation of all the people I've spoken to on my podcast, and I really wanted to be a voice for these Japanese researchers and um, everyday Japanese or Japanese artists. And a lot of researchers, they're very good at researching, but struggle to share their work. So that was one of the reasons I wrote the book for obviously people who have an interest in Japan and who either don't have the time to go or maybe don't have the time to learn the language but really do appreciate Japanese culture. And for me, it was, I guess, a way to almost self-actualize and ex express myself. I struggled with English at school, so I never imagined I would write a book. Uh, but it was, a, yeah, it was a meaningful challenge. 
and became, I guess, a source of ikigai too. And, and writing, I guess writing is a way to express yourself. So that was that was a really interesting process. And yeah, the book is available on the Amazon Marketplace. So if that interests some of your audience, yeah, they could find it there. Well, let's talk about other Japanese cultural concepts or Japanese words that are misunderstood. Sure. I guess one is one that's quite popular at the moment is wabi sabi. And wabi sabi is misunderstood as an adjective meaning something like imperfect beauty or something that's looks looks a certain way, looks either old but still um, captures your eye. And so in the West, we have this tendency to either commercialize these, these concepts and almost think we can create them. And you'll often see wabi-sabi associated to interior design in the West. But in Japan, wabi-sabi is a noun and it's actually something you sense. And again, it's, it's very organic and actually Traditionally, it's a word associated to a pottery aesthetic, and that was actually the the aesthetic my father-in-law was trying to achieve. So it's something you feel, I guess, when you you see a piece of pottery, or maybe it could be something you you feel with a certain type of music or when you connect with nature. So it's very hard to manufacture. I don't think you can sort of create wabi-sabi. There's some natural process and it seems to involve the natural elements. So in the case of pottery, clay, water, fire, air. Um, But yeah, in the West, we've kind of think, oh, yeah, I know what wabi-sabi is. It's, you know, it's imperfect beauty and it's something related to interior design. And yeah, that's just not the case. Uh, And there's another concept related to pottery too called kintsuki, Kintsugi is this idea or it's actually a process to repair broken pottery where they essentially use a, it's almost like a, we could call it a gold glue. And it's an ancient process that started in Japan with, originally with Chinese pottery. And there's a famous story of a a lord who accidentally broke one of his cups and he actually sent it back to uh, to China to be repaired and they think they repaired it using wire or I guess in the end it wasn't what he was hoping so he commissioned an artist to to try and repair it properly and this artist came up with this technique to infuse gold to uh, bring back the pieces of the pottery together and you have these pieces of pottery that were broken that are now uh, pieced back together, but they have these beautiful gold cracks in them. And again, we've commercialized this idea and now companies make, essentially they make a pottery that looks as if it's been broken and put back together with this technique. So these beautiful cultural concepts that have a history and have all this craftsmanship sort of become commercialized in the West, unfortunately. Do you have any current or upcoming projects that you're working on that people <laughs> need to know about? Well, let's see. Uh, there's maybe another book in the in the process, and I might actually make a journal for my current current book because there is a lot of self reflection and thoughts on life meaning and life purpose. But I'm sure, as you know, Curtis, there's always something to do. <laughs> There's always something to uh, explore. So, yeah, for me at the moment, I guess it's writing. Absolutely. And for those who want to explore what you're going to be up to and, and check out your your work, give out your contact information, any websites, social media links, so people can follow you. Thank you. They can learn about Ikigai Tribe at ikigaitribe.com. And related to the book, they can go to ikigaikan.com. And I'm lucky I have Nicholas Kemp as my handle for Twitter. So, yeah, people can find me on those websites or via Twitter. All right. Close us out with some final thoughts. Maybe something that 
I failed to touch on that you would like to talk about it? Just any final thoughts you have for the listeners? One final thought, I guess, is Ikigai is very much related to our social world. So we could understand Ikigai as the intimacy we feel in friendship, in family, in, in the people we love. So one thing we can always do is catch up with a friend or call an old friend and check in on them. And there's nothing like having a conversation with an old friend. So, yeah, just remember we often feel Ikigai strongly when we connect or reconnect with the people we care about or when we make new new connections as well, like uh, what we're doing today. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, use that Ikigai and call a friend that you haven't talked to in a while. IkigaiTribe.com. Nick Kemp, please be sure to follow, rate, review, check out his work, listen to his podcast, pick up his book. Nick, thank you so much for joining me today and sharing your expertise about Icky Guy to my listeners. Well, thank you so much, Curtis, for having me on. It's been a real joy and I greatly appreciate it. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.